Hello, I'm Simon Kennan, editor of Interventional Cardiology Review, and I am here at Euro PCR 2015 with Andrew Sharp to talk about IFR, instantaneous wave free ratio. Andrew, welcome. Thank, Thank you for coming along. Thank you. Um, could you take us through the basic principles behind IFR? Sure. So, uh, FFR is a measure of pressure loss across a stenosis, comparing pressure in the aorta, pressure in the distal bed. And FFR uses the whole cycle, systole and diastole, to measure this ratio of pressure across the lesion. IFR uh, looks at a period of diastole where microvascular resistance has been shown to be stable on wave intensity analysis. The idea being that perhaps we can then avoid the need for adenosine to stabilize resistance in whole cycle FFR assessment. And therefore we can do this measure without the need for any intravenous drug by uh, creating stable resistance naturally within diastole. So it's, uh, it's proposed as a simpler tool, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a quicker tool without the need for these intravenous drugs that uh, FFR requires. Simpler, no IV drugs and a better marker of stenosis, better marker of the functional significance of stenosis? I don't think we can say that yet. I mean, we've got uh, over 20 years now of FFR research and quite a large body of work on clinical outcomes and on the reliability of the tool. I, I think FFR is an excellent tool. Uh, its uptake has not been sufficient. In 2012, only 6% of PCI cases had FFR results before. So clearly, despite it being on the market for 16 years, mm. there's something that's inhibiting doctors from using it regularly. So if we followed the guidelines, what percentage of our cases would involve FFR? Well, coronary physiology. Yeah, well, the, the, the recent ESC myocardial revascularization guidelines suggest that if you do not have evidence of reversible ischemia from a non-invasive test, and you have a lesion that's not truly critical, yeah. you should consider FFR. Yeah. Now, when you look at real-world data sets from the United States, uh, still, in 2012, only 50% of cases that go forward for PCI have a non-invasive assessment beforehand. Right. So, we could be looking at a very large volume of uh, pressure wire cases required here if we routinely take patients to the lab without ischemia testing. Okay. Now, I know it's highly variable from centre to centre, from country to country, as to whether people get a nuclear test before, a stress echo, a stress mm -hmm. MRI, or an excise treadmill test. But the role of FFR in the, in the REVAS guidelines is to demonstrate ischemia where there is uncertainty. So that's uh, a considerable amount of cases. Yeah, okay. And we're still in sing single figures. Uh, in the UK, the numbers have gone up year on year. Uh, if I remember in the last BSIS guidelines, uh, it's uh, something of the of, of order of 10% of cases. Okay. Uh, but again, it's still relatively low volumes. Okay. So what data do we have for IFR? Hmm. So the way that IFR has been validated uh, in uh, real-world cath labs to date has been to compare it to FFR. So we consider FFR the gold standard. It's been out there for a long time and we have clinical outcomes data. So the question that's been asked by the group leading this uh, is uh, can we reliably predict what FFR would show using just IFR, a quicker measure without the need for intravenous drugs? Uh, and uh, the answer is we can predict it pretty well. Uh, of course, the problem with these results is they're dichotomized. So if you have an FFR, uh, you get a lot of information from that number. If it's 0 0.6, 0 0.75, or 0.89, that gives you a lot of information. Once you dichotomize it into a yes-no binary outcome, uh, uh, 0.8 or less, or above 0.8, mm. we lose a lot of sophistication from that number. When you compare IFR as a continuous variable against FFR, there's a very close correlation. When you dichotomize it, it's probably 80-85% um, predictive ability to, for IFR to say the same thing as FFR in a dichotomous stop-goal fashion. Yep. So treat, don't treat. Okay. Uh, and I think with any measure where, we, uh, where it has an inherent variability and then we dichotomize it, it's going to be very difficult to get better than that with any tool. Okay. Um, and randomized outcome data, the trials are ongoing? Yeah, and I think we can't say that uh, IFR uh, is the preeminent uh, physiology tool in the cath lab until we have these data. You know, FFR have done outcome studies, we've got FAME studies, the first study, that tell us that if we defer 
uh, non-floral limiting lesions, these patients will do well. If we treat them, they'll do better than if, if, we, uh, if we treat significant flow limitation, uh, they'll do better than if uh, we leave them on medical therapy. I think we need similar data from IFR, and there are two major trials ongoing. So the DEFINE FLARE trial uh, is uh, all around the world now, it's so over 50 centres involved. It's aiming for 2,500 patients. Uh, and we randomised IFR or FFR on the basis of the clinical judgment of an intermediate stenosis that requires a physiological measure to tell us whether to treat or not to treat. So again, it, it does have this dichotomous concept that if you're randomised to FFR and it's, the FFR is less than 0.8, you're asked to treat the lesion with an undefined flat. If the IFR is less than 0.9, uh, then you're asked to treat it with IFR. Uh, and um, we'll then follow the patients up for five years and we'll see whether there's uh, similar rates of hard endpoints like death, MI and uh, revascularization. And where are we with recruitment? So at the last recruitment, uh, I think we were over 1,700 out of oh, okay. 2,500 done. Uh, there's also a parallel registry study done. You know these amazing guys in Sweden who do these registry studies in double quick time. Uh, so the IFR Sweetheart study is being run by Matthias Gottberg from Lund. Uh, he's also going great guns as are all the Swedes. Ready. And that's a randomised study? Correct. Right. It's, it's a very similar design to mm -hmm. Define Flare actually. It's just that it's boxed off with a registry study and uh, it's, again it's 2,000 patients. So the studies are looking with similar enough protocols and similar endpoints that eventually the two data sets will be able to be combined. So we're going to have four and a half thousand patients of intermediate lesions mm. uh, and hard endpoint data of five years, which is going to be the largest coronary physiology work ever undertaken. Yeah. Okay. Is coronary flow velocity going to start to become more important in this field? Well, we get more data from flow. So what causes angina? It's deficient flow, not deficient pressure. The problem with flow is one measures it with a, a Doppler flow wire in a similar way to how we put a, uh, a field of view through an aortic valve when we're looking for aortic stenosis. Mm. And as you know, that's very angle dependent, very operator dependent. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of variability. And it's the same with flow in the coronaries. So it's quite a difficult thing to measure reliably and reproducibly. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, what we did was switch to pressure, which is very easy to measure. Yeah high levels of reproducibility, yeah. we can do it quickly and easily, and we're using pressure as a surrogate for flow. So we're not actually measuring the thing that we really want, yeah, which true. is deficient flow in the coronaries. Yeah. We're just inferring it from pressure. And they've got a very close relationship uh, within um, uh, stenosis uh, rates that aren't so totally occluded, for example. Uh, we do see very clearly a, a linear relationship across uh, various degrees of stenosis. Mm -hmm. And so it is a reasonably reliable measure. Okay. So can I take it from that you don't think measuring coronary flow velocity is going to be on the menu routinely for some time? Yeah, I think that's right. There needs to be an iterative change in the technology to make it simpler if we're going to use it. Uh, I mean, it does give us extra information. When one measures flow and pressure, they differ uh, in up to a quarter of cases. Mm -hmm. So. When we see uh, what we think is an acceptable uh, pressure trace, allowing us to defer a case, the flow levels might be really quite low, mm. and therefore a patient could easily be having angina due to that lesion, mm. and the flow would demonstrate that. Uh, but um, we've got about a 12% false positive rate and a 12% false negative rate of pressure-guided indices against flow. Mm. The question is, is that important enough to turn a simple technology back yeah. to a difficult uh, technology with poor More reproducibility. Terms really, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So I think probably for now it remains a research tool. Okay. There, is, there is a study ongoing called Define Flow where they're trying to use coronary flow measurements and pressure measurements to see what sort of incremental benefits we can get in predicting outcomes. Uh, but that's a much smaller study than the Define Flow pressure trace uh, studies. And who, who's making the flow wires? Uh, so Volcano make Volcano. one. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure about other companies, but Volcano do make one. And are they keen on the idea? Are they investing? Or are they, they focusing are. more on IFR? They are. Uh, I mean, it, com it obviously is a much smaller market at the moment, uh, looking at flow versus pressure. I know that they do have engineers working on it all the time, mm. trying to make it easier and more reproducible. Uh, but um, uh, right now, the iteration that Volcano have produced 
in technology is IFR scout rather than concentrating so much on a complete overhaul of flow measurements. Could we finally, talking about Volcano, could we talk about uh, their most recent development, which I believe we've been talking about this week? Yeah, so um, IFR Scout has recently come onto the market about six weeks ago. Uh, it uh, uses IFR's uh, ability to assess uh, pressure loss across a diffusive disease vessel in basal conditions without the need for hyperion flow, so without the need for adenosine and such like. The idea behind it is we put a wire down the coronary in a coronary with multiple lesions. We then pull it back by hand, there's no need for motorized pullback. And then it gives us a pressure trace on the screen and it shows us where the steps of pressure loss are across the various lesions in the vessel. So perhaps a right coronary artery has three lesions, one at the distal bifurcation, one at the midpoint of the vessel, and one at the proximal point of the vessel. Now, FFR, fantastic tool, but when you try and work out which of those lesions is responsible for most pressure loss, you have a very complex calculation that's not so uh, accessible in the cath lab in real time. With IFR, it appears that there's much less of this lesion crosstalk. And if, it, if there's a six or seven point drop in the IFR value across the middle lesion in the mid right, then if we stent that, we appear to see an improvement of six or seven points in the IFR. So mm -hmm. in other words, we can start to predict if we treat a section of vessel, what is going to happen to it without worrying about this crosstalk thing that might lead us to perhaps make a wrong inference about the distribution of each uh, lesion to ischemia. Uh, so it appears to be a, a lovely simple tool. Uh, it's very quick, just pop it down, pull it back, it takes about 20 seconds, and you get this nice visual graph. You'll have to be looking at fluoro so you can co-register in your own mind. Yep. It, it isn't yet automated. Um, but um, I've used it now in a number of cases and it's, it's been really quite helpful. And it, I've stented a section of the vessel that I, f I thought would be the most straightforward that has been demonstrated on the pre-procedural IFR scout to suggest that if I just did that bit I would relieve ischemia. Checked afterwards and it appears to have done just what, just what it was supposed to do. Okay. So, and automated co-registration that is coming. That's coming. Yeah, there's some uh, beautiful pictures with uh, colour and dots mm. and the sort of thing that uh, really attracts an interventional cardiologist. Absolutely. So that's in development, I think, and that's not coming for another year or so. Okay. But the IFR Scout is available now just as a software upgrade on Volcano Systems. And I think once, once uh, people have done 10 cases or so of diffusive disease vessels, I think, I think they won't go back because sometimes we'll see just a steady rise in the IFR as we pull it back and we realise that there's no one area we can stent to transform this vessel. And in other cases, we expect that, and we get a sudden jump in the mid-vessel that might allow us to stent it and raise the whole vessel above the ischemic threshold. And it's really quite hard to predict that from a basic angiogram of a diffusive disease vessel, it gives us that quite easily. And am I right in thinking that changing an FFR wire to an IFR wire is just a question of a software switch within the, the monitor? That's, that's right, correct? that's right, it's the same technology. Yeah. So okay. it's the same pressure wire and it's just a, a different calculation. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, IFR requires an ECG trace, which most of us will have on our pressure wire systems. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you don't need anything special over and above the software algorithm, and it will do it automatically for you in real time now. The IFR Scout uh, software will give you a beat by beat IFR. So you just put the wire down and there it is. It tells you what the pressure loss is. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andrew. Lots to look Pleasure. forward to. Thanks very much.